The 2022 May Conference. Jeff Saltzenstein, 7 Serve Drills to Transform Your Program. I'm going to talk about the tossing arm, okay? When you go to the tossing arm right here, the palm is up. And when it gets to here, we sometimes see the tossing arm kind of stop. Or we even see people have this bent arm toss right here. If they're not able to straighten their arm up like this, guess what? There's a good chance it's a physical issue, that they can't do it. So again, they're going to have to work on their shoulder flexibility, their ability to side bend, all performance things off the court. Remember, I'm just trying to plant seeds right now to get you thinking about, okay, it's not just about giving a lesson. We can help our players if we surround ourselves with a team that can help, help them improve their bodies as well. But when we get to here, the biggest thing I notice, especially with the more high performance, is when they get to here, if they can, if they can rotate their tossing arm and reach up and spread their fingers like this. So we see this, and we see this, and we see this. So if you could just have them practice in their trophy position holds, let's say they're here, see if they can just stretch up and hold for five seconds, 10 seconds. Now when the ball's in play, they're probably not gonna do it, but it's just a starting point. We're just planting some seeds, okay? But right here, palm to the side, fingers spread like lightning bolts coming out. Maybe they could hang a minute a day to, you know, stretch out a little bit more, right? Because if you, if you get to here and it stops, there's probably something going on in this, in this area. With the toss, real quick, um, since we're in this area of the serve here, I like to get the toss, you know, in the fingertips more, not directly in the palm. You all probably know this, it's nothing new. But I try to get them to practice tossing the ball with no spin. We know that's a tough thing to do, and we know even pros still spin the ball out of their hand. But you could do little drills where you just have them practice, even if it's a little, even if it's a little right there, just watch the ball and see if they can do it. Now remember, I don't spend time really on the toss because I know that a lot of this stuff is chopped up. So I just spend time helping them with that first move. Because what I find is that if their motion improves, actually their toss starts to improve. Most players have really high tosses, so if we fix their rhythm, the toss starts to improve. But I don't want to spend a ton of time on the toss. We can maybe handle it at the end of the presentation. But I really want to emphasize the point that I think we're missing the boat when it comes to that first move and just getting into this position right here. Even all the tension that I see in the hand right here. Okay. We're gonna do one more section and then I'm just gonna take a few minutes to pause before we round this thing out. And I wanna talk about the early racket drop. Actually, you know what, This I take that back. That's a good starting point, a stopping point. So uh, any questions so far? Objections, uh, you're, full of, you're full of BS, Jeff, or uh, yeah, questions, anything so far? Yeah. Anything that you wrote down? I have one. Yes. I have a gentleman. He's in his early 70s. Yes. But he insists on tossing the ball. He said from the fingertips. It's yeah. just not help him. Okay. But he insists on tossing it from his palm. He said he's more consistent with that. Sure. So. Great. If that's what he feels, do it. I'm not the type of coach that says you have to do it okay. this way. I'm the type of coach that tries to, I try to educate and then they can, we collaborate together. But if he's dead set on this is how it works best for him, I go with it. So I don't try to force it. A lot of times players have to do things when they're ready, but maybe you could present to him evidence that, hey, there's players that do it from their fingertips. So I wouldn't force it. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, yep. what's the purpose of the early bend? I don't really understand. The early bend? Are you loading a little early with that? Yeah, great question. So the question is, what's the purpose of the early bend? So <clears throat> what I mentioned earlier is that what I feel happens is that there's a lot of things. When you toss the ball without bending early, there's a tendency for the toss to get really high. That's number one. Number two, there's a tendency for, the, for only the arms to work instead of the body to work. There's also a tendency for the rhythm things to be out of sync. This idea that you toss it first and then you bend, you know, I see a lot of squatting afterwards, like this, after the ball is released. So what, in my experience, I feel like when you bend early, look at, if I bend early, it's not just bending, it's bending and loading, right? So if you'll notice, this move, 
my weight is on my back foot, which again, most players, where are they going? Right away when they toss, they're on their front foot because they don't know how to load. So we have to actually help them. And I have drills, you know, in, my, in some of my programs, we have drills to help people load their back leg. If you're gonna throw a ball, you're gonna get back on that back leg into your back chain, into your back glute right here, and then you're gonna fire. So by bending early, we're teaching the body to load essentially right away. Like that's the most important thing. So that's, that's my best answer to kind of give you that. It's just rhythm, tempo, getting things to happen, loading, all good things start to happen when you get this bend to happen early. Um, one other thing I want to mention that I didn't talk about with the trophy position is we see a lot of players, you probably see it as well, when they bend their knees, tell me if this looks familiar. Squatting, we call this an S posture where the butt goes back. So the serve is not your traditional squat where you sit back with a bar like this, or even if you do a body weight squat, that is not the serve when you bend. What it really is, is a wall squat. So if let's pretend there's a wall right here, okay? I'll use the cart. The serve is a wall squat. And I'll show that in a minute when I get into trophy position. That is a serve. It is not that. So it's different than forward locomotion, forward movement. You're sliding down a wall when you get into your trophy position. Now, if someone tries to do that and they can only get to here, what do you think the issue is? Hips, what else? Knees, back. It's your ankles you don't have ankle mobility. And most people lose their ankle mobility. So if you can help, and you should test it yourself. When you slide down a wall, can you get your knees over your toes like this? When you do a squat, okay, no gasping, all right? But if you do a squat, most people do a squat like this. Knee over, toe, knee, knee over the foot, right? But there's this guy on the internet that has millions of followers named Knees Over Toes. And he healed his knee injuries by learning how to do that, right? So basically, when you're doing, when you, watch this, when you're in trophy position, when you're in trophy position, watch my knees. How far are my knees over my toes? Mm -hmm. Pretty far. So guess what? If you can't do that, there's your trophy position. If you can't get your knees over your toes, you can't get your hips to go forward and tuck underneath you. So what, what I try to help players with, in this trophy, if I see that they're here, I make them push their pelvis forward a little bit. See that, what I just did? So I'm here, it's like a, was it, cat-cow? If you're here and here, basically you're doing the cat-cow. You're squatting and then you're pushing your hips forward. That's the move but you won't be able to get people to do that if they can't get their knees over their toes. So this goes back to this idea that when we're teaching the serve, we have to be able to see what their body can do. I'm never gonna force people into these positions if their body can't do it. And you'll see if you take a video on the phone and you see them go like this, there's a really good chance that their feet, they have tight hips because they're sitting all day and their knees can't go forward like this, okay? Any other quick questions or objections before I move on to the last few phases? So Jeff, we've heard for years though, as people do lunges, you know, kick the knee back, so. Correct, and we have, a, we have the biggest rash of ACL and yeah. Achilles tears in the world now. I wonder why. But that's, uh, yeah. but, but that comes from the ankle. So the, the idea that that hurts your knee is really the ankle flexibility. Yeah, is. go check out Knees Over Toes, uh, Knees Over Toes guy on Instagram. He's basically, you know, kind of a revolutionary guy, but he's training a lot of players to get, or not tennis players, but just athletes and even people in general to be able to get into these motions because it actually trains your connective tissue to go there. Obviously, you don't want to do it with pain, but we have a rash epidemic of knee problems because people are losing their hip function and their ankle function. It's not their knees. It's their hips and their ankles. So if you fix your ankle mobility, we have all these kids today 
it's crazy. I'm going to be 49 in October, and I got 16 year olds coming to my court, and they cannot do the things I can do with my body because they're sitting all day doing this, and they're sitting on their couch. You could, you could, you know, kids over time, I know we're digressing a little bit, but they could be practicing a lot more of this. This is going to help your ankle mobility, right? So. Yeah, it's going to require a paradigm shift to be able to realize that if you want to get into these positions, you have to be able to, you have to train it. You can't just come out on the court and do it. But Federer and others can do that because they got people working on all this stuff all the time. Hey, okay, Jack, yep. What did you change with Isi Yunovich that to, to raise your serve 20 miles an hour at right. that level is incredible? Yeah, I think for me, it was, it was kind of accidental. Um, but the biggest thing from what I remember, I was in a pinpoint, but I just got back on my back foot a lot more. I got into a wider base and I just kind of thrust my body in and then like something clicked. And again, it was like an accidental transformation. My second transformation with Yandel, where I changed to a platform was more methodical and thoughtful and got my hand in a better position. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those things where it just clicked modeling. And that's the importance of like, especially with your high performance juniors, they learn more from watching the best in the world than taking lessons from us. If they watch Federer or Djokovic, they can go out and mimic a two-handed backhand faster than us technically teaching them. So we take it in through the eyes, not through words. And so letting, letting these high-performance kids like model is, is one of the best things that you can do. All right, I want to keep moving because we've got a lot to cover and I'm, I'm behind. I'm about 10 minutes behind, but we'll, we'll get it to work. All right, so we're going to get back to uh, a, a common mistake, and this is the fifth section. All right, so we've covered uh, grip, we've covered setup or stance, we've covered first move, and then we've covered trophy position and toss. So we've covered four things so far. The fifth is a racket drop or the early racket drop. And you're going to see this a lot as well, and it feeds right into the first move that I talked about earlier. So with the first move, I'm sorry, with the early racket drop, what's happening is the racket gets up to this position, the knees are bent, and the racket drops before the legs go. You see that, right? So the, the arms move, and then the racket drops. Sorry, I, I gotta try to do it wrong. They're here, and the racket drops, and then their legs go. Can you picture that? And if you can't, it's okay. You can start to look for that now. So the early racket drop happens, one, because again, the motion, the arms get up here. So where else is the racket gonna go? It has to either drop or the racket has to drop because of how we started. And again, I had a, the kid from, that's going to Notre Dame. He had an early racket drop and he's an advanced player. He's what, probably 11 or 12 UTR. He's 17 years old. He had an early racket drop. As soon as we corrected, as soon as we got him here, the racket drop magically got better. Because before, his racket was already here when he started bending. Now he's waiting for the ball, and so now the racket has to go. So everything's out of sync. If we were to hook him up to like a, if we were gonna put like a, do like a kinetic energy test where we, we saw which joints and which parts of the body moved in unison, it would be out of sync. And they do that all the time in golf. They measure uh, which part of the swing gets out of swing sink, and that's what we see with the early racket drop. That is an issue not only with the tempo, but also if someone can't use their lower body correctly, they're gonna get power with what? Their arm. They're gonna try to find power of the arm, and when they try to find power of the arm and they don't use their body correctly, what might happen? Injuries. Injuries. So if you see shoulders and elbows, and then you see the early racket drop, you can make this connection. So. The way to fix it is, getting back to that first move, if you have the person bend right away and their toss gets lower and the racket stays here, you don't even have time to have an early racket drop. Because you'll be here and then when you go to the ball, it's just going to drop after the legs go up. So that's the big key. If you watch this motion right here, I'm in my full trophy position, you will see, you will see as soon as the legs start to straighten, this racket is starting to lay back. Okay, so you can look for that going forward, that early racket drop. You can fix it again with the first move, just make sure the racket stays down here. 
the ball is released and the knees are bent, you're not going to have that early racket drop issue anymore. As soon as the racket goes up, you're going to have that, that challenge. Now, I came up with a couple drills that can also help with this. I find that that one is the one that works the best. Remember with the grip, when I talked about you could practice actually coming at the ball the opposite position. Instead of like this, you come at it from this position and then you rotate. This is similar with the exaggeration. So what you practice is when you get to here, when what you do is you actually practice straightening your legs completely and you keep the racket here, which is crazy, right? Because we've already released all the energy. But all I'm trying to do is do the opposite of the problem. The problem is this. Now we go to here and we actually straighten and then we drop. Okay, we straighten and then we drop. Does that make sense? Complete opposite. So the, and again, I have a video for this. If you want the video drill and just send me an email at Jeff at Tennis Evolution, I'll give it to you at the end. But I can send you this drill if you want to use it and copy it and model it. But the idea again is you get players to here, you get them to here and you have them actually straighten and then swing. Now, the next key, we're going to get into the contact point. You want to make sure when they do that, that when they go to, they do this drill, they do it correctly at contact, which I'm going to I mention in a moment. But does that make sense that you want to straighten your legs first and then the racket drops? And the way to fix it would be to do a drill, would be you make them straighten and then they drop. Yeah? We good there? Okay. The next part around the racket drop, we call it the high hand. So with the high hand, and this is the, this is the mistake players are making, and you're going to see this a lot. When a player goes to swing at the ball, especially if they have a forehand grip, but if, even if they have a continental, if they go to swing and the racket drop is in this position and the hand is above the elbow, players email me like, I can't fix my racket drop. You know, you see the pros where they get to here and the hand is way, I can't really show it because it's a dynamic move. Here's what's going on. When players swing and they go to the ball and the hand stays above the elbow and the racket drop, it's typically not a technical issue. It's a physical issue. And here's what's happening. One, they may re, uh, lack shoulder mobility, okay? So if you don't have good external rotation, you're not gonna be able to drop the racket. But that's the obvious issue. The biggest issue is this right here, the thoracic mobility, the middle of the chest. So when I get to trophy position, if I want to have a killer racket drop, watch what my chest does when I go up to the ball. What's it do? What percentage of people over 50 can do this? Right? So we watch players serve and we say, oh, you're just not dropping your racket. Yes, sure, we can get them to loosen the hand on the racket. Okay, we can get the wrist looser, that will help. We can work on their shoulder mobility, that will help. But if they can't open their chest right there, when they go up to the ball, no chance they're gonna have a good racket drop. And again, what are we doing all day? We're sitting at a computer with our chest in all day. So how are we gonna be able to open up our chest? So this again, where you need to find someone in your area that can help you with their, with their ability to open up their chest. We call it thoracic mobility or the thorax, right? So they get to here, and when they go up to the ball, the chest has to be able to open like this. See that? That's what the pros are doing right there. So the chest is neutral in here. Most people, when they get to trophy, their chest is open. You'll see that when you watch video now. Their chest is open like this, so that when they go to swing, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to expand, there's nowhere to go. So you're gonna be neutral and you open. So again, that racket drop, you can fix it. You can fix it if you get them kind of swinging and like dangling the racket. If they're squeezing the racket tight, you're right, the hand's not gonna drop. So you can help them with relaxation. But the biggest thing, especially with the older population, over 40, over 50, is they're not able to go here. So you tell them, hey, I think you gotta work on this, this thoracic mobility, let's get you Let's find some exercises. Hey, you can go on YouTube and, and find videos that can help you open up your thoracic area. Remember too, this is a bigger picture than just the serve. 
if you get people like opening up their chest and breathing better, they're gonna have a higher quality of life. That's where you can become the life coach, right? You can help them with performance, not just making sure they have a great time on the court. You can actually inspire them with these different, different tips. Okay, contact point. We got contact point, we got the finish, and then we got a little bonus at the end. So, the contact point. This one is really interesting because again, over the last decade, I've seen the same, kind of the same issues at contact. One of the biggest ones that I see is that when people make contact, tell me if this might look familiar to you, when they make contact, See, I'll do it this way. When they make contact, at contact, I'll do it this way, their shoulders are facing the net and they're bent over like this. Do you see that? Okay. So, what does Roger Federer do at contact? When he makes contact, his body is at chest is about, I'd say about a 45 degree angle and he's in this posture and he's actually kind of side bending like this. All right. So this is what it looks like. I'm here, I go to contact, and I'm in this position. Well, most people are like that. So again, this is a body issue. People physically can't do it. They have a hard time holding this position, right? Very advanced. But my thought is like, okay, why is that happening? It's not just they get to this point and they're here. There's a reason this is happening. Maybe it's because of that first move because they didn't turn in the beginning, right? Because if I just use my arms and I don't turn, how else am I going to get power? I'm going to have to rotate, right? So that goes back to that first move, teaching people how to be able to turn and coil in the beginning. And if they can't do it with their technique, they got to work on their body to be able to do it. So if you get them to turn better, when they go up to the ball, they're automatically going to be in this better position, okay? Doesn't guarantee it they can still go from here and over rotate but we even see this at the highest level you know a lot of pros are still struggling with this kind of over rotation thing happening so how do we fix it um, one way that you can help them with is just I, I go up against a wall uh, I want to make sure the cameras are Let's this way. This pass out here. You might miss this part. So what I do is I force them, I force them to reach up like this and work on this movement right here. So now they have a cue because the, the wrong way would be like this, so the inefficient way would be like this. So we're here. And we're holding that and they're gonna feel stretches in their body that they've never felt before. Again, this is more obviously private lesson. I mean, you could probably try it in a group if you wanted to have fun with it. I think you need to educate them first. And it's also down the line. It's not the most important thing. But when I'm working with players that really want to change their serve, I have them feel this right here. And it's there's, there's side bend happening. The racket is above the shoulder right here. I'm a big believer in positions. And you have to be able to improve this position. They can do it with their eyes closed. This is something they can do at home. All we're trying to do, I'm not asking for people to get this. What I'm asking for is more awareness. Awareness of how to practice, awareness of the different positions that are breaking down. And if they can start to feel this over time, instead of this, it may make a difference. So I like that, oh, one of the biggest things is, is the eyes at contact. And I call, I call that the eyes at contact drill. So you'll notice when I'm here, look at where my eyes are at. But most people, their head yeah. is there, right? Because they want to see where their ball went, right? Because they want to win. They have to train, and you'll see Federer's great at it, obviously, but you want to train where, this is a great drill when you introduce the ball, is I, don't watch the ball, okay? Watch my eyes and my head, and notice what my body does. What did my eyes do? They just stay there. Did my head move? Yeah. Is, my, is my body rotating? Yeah. A little bit, right? It's rotating, but it's rotating. I feel it like I'm, rot I'm stable here, and I hit, and then, I'm, then I come through. Mm. 
but most people go there before they hit, right? So that just having them toss the ball and keeping even keeping their, their shoulders as much at an angle as possible can make a difference. To get that feeling again, of, instead of going here, they're going, they're going here. Okay? That's your contact. All right, you can tell I thought a lot about this, huh? All right, the finish. So the finish, um, what we see a lot is the landing is off, okay? And so you can even help your players with their landing. So I see, I'll do it, I'll kind of demo it righty. So let's assume the player is standing like this so when they jump, if they jump, I see a lot of players jumping and landing over there. Sometimes they jump and they land over here, but most of the time it's this kind of fade that way, right? So I'll do it lefty now. So what I just do is I make sure I line up this line, right? Right in line with the heel and they want to be landing in this position so you can gamify this you know offer your kids hey I'll give you a million dollars in monopoly money or a million dollars in crypto before the crash yeah. and if they land here they win right and so you can have them practice landing and landing in the right spot that's one of the biggest things if, if I'm not going to change a lot of technique I'll try to get them to land on balance and you'll learn a lot about them you know, if they have a really hard time and they're fading this way, they're going to have to really work at this landing. And the landing that I like is, sure, you can land, and I've seen it on Instagram, you can land and do this. I like a one-two. So I like, I like land, two. That's your two. That way, they're not trying to stabilize on that leg when it lands. It's pretty difficult to do. I just like one-two. That's the practice. A lot of people, when they do it, this step gets really big. So we're just landing on balance. One, two, okay? Uh, the other thing around the, um, the finish is, and this one's a bit controversial because a lot of coaches are gonna say, hey, once the ball leaves the racket, uh, it doesn't matter what happens at the follow through. I disagree with that um, because I've worked with a couple of coaches that were obsessed with that and they helped number one players in the world and that was one of their key drills. So I'm not here to say you have to be in the contact point camp or the finish camp. I'm just from my experience, when you get the finished position, a lot of other things work pretty well. So one thing I love for ball control, and um, again, assuming a continental grip, is at the end of the swing, if you want to help someone with ball control, with like say a topspin serve, or even a slice serve, notice what my hand is doing at the end. So I'll turn towards you and you guys can tell me. What's my hand do? Yeah, so obviously we don't want to do this, you know, early, right? There's still pronation happening. But if you study Federer and Djokovic, you'll see, you'll see this type of a look and it creates ball control. And so if you want to hit nasty, like if you don't do it, which we see a lot of players, and this is an example of a tip, again, it doesn't require a big technical overhaul. So we probably need to have a bucket where it's like, hey, you can do this tomorrow, and we need a bucket like it's long-term, right? This would fall into the short-term bucket if they have a continental grip. You see a lot of players serve, and they work so much on pronation, and the racket is more like this, but if you add this little layer, this little dimension, right, the ball really, you hear the sound, there's a lot of, there's a lot of feel and spin and control. So what I tell my players to do is just take your hand to the belly button, and you just turn your hand up. It's not going to work if they don't have a true continental, or even towards a backhand grip. So, right to the belly button. And this is amazing for wide slice serves. So, quick tip here on the, on the serve. I want you to pay, you're not gonna be able to see my hand, but I want you to watch my shoulders. This is a little sidebar. If I go down the tee, so 
sorry, not warmed up. That's my excuse. Okay, let's say that was my tea serve, right? You'll notice some, uh, sorry. I didn't hit a serve that I it wasn't accurate enough. Okay, <laughs> here we go. So we go TOA to pay attention to my shoulders. And then my hand is pretty neutral. If I go wide, look at what I did to my shoulders and my hand. So I didn't change anything in the motion until the ball was gone and it did a completely different thing to the ball. So your hand, you can do different things with your hand, which is really cool. Um, so some of your players, again, that have continental grips, they have more advanced serves, you can, on the wide slice, have them bring their shoulder around more afterwards and have them feel this little curl with the hand. That's at the finish. So we have two drills for the finish. We have the landing, what you do with your legs, and then we have your hand, what you do, the hand curl. Okay, we're in the home stretch. Thank you so much for staying with me on this. All right, so the, the final thing that I wanna talk about, this little bonus, and, and I've touched on it already, is, is the strength and mobility concept. So I, uh, about four years ago, I was speaking at the World Conference in Orlando, and I was doing a talk on footwork. And Dr. Greg Rose, who runs the Tiles Performance Institute, um, I guess he'd been watching me on, on my YouTube videos, he came up to me and he said, hey, I want to have breakfast with you tomorrow. Uh, I've got to talk to you about this project I'm working on. And so basically what he's done the last 25 years is he has studied the biomechanics of the golf swing and he's linked it to how the human body works. And so you've seen that weave throughout that if you physically can't do things, you're not going to be able to improve your technique the way you want. So the Tiles Performance Institute, he's worked with the best golfers in the world. Anybody who's won a major championship, he's probably worked with them behind the scenes. And so he developed a program called Racket Fit. You may have heard of it, but he basically brought me on as the lead technical, technical consultant. And it's one reason why I feel like I can stand in front of you right now and teach you all of this stuff, because I already knew a lot about the serve before I met him, but now I'm able to make the connection to how the body works. He's really helped me a lot. And so there is a seminar June 7th. It's online. It's a one-day seminar. And my guess is that after today's talk, if you retained it or if you can watch the video later, you now know more than 99% of all coaches in the world around the serve, just in this hour and a half. So I commend all of you for making the effort to be here. But if you really want to learn biomechanics and like how the body is connected to what I'm teaching today, I encourage you to get certified in racket fit and come to that seminar. Because again, some of the things you're going to learn, and I touched on it earlier, I wanted to give three little tips here. And the tips are, uh, on the S posture, okay, yeah. So we already actually talked about two of them. I gave them away. So on the S posture, remember, if somebody bends and you see this curve in the low back, there's a good chance that they lack ankle mobility. So if you see something up here that doesn't right look right, see how you can help their feet and their ankles. If you see someone that has a high hand, there's a good chance what? If, if right here. What, what's going on here? Do you guys remember? Shoulder. 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 What else? Yeah. Say it out loud, louder. Thoracic. Who said thoracic? He gets a free grip MD. Yeah. Woo! All right. So thoracic. So if someone can't drop their hand, that means they can't open up their chest. They don't have the thoracic extension to be able to do that. All right. So here's the third one that I didn't talk about. What we see a lot is when someone's in trophy position, and then whether they have a, a pinpoint or a platform, if we see this front knee buckle in, so if we see this move right here, or if we see the back knee buckle in like this, you may have seen this, what may be causing that? Hip flexors, go lower, ankles again. So if you see something called, if you see this, Yes, it could be hip stability right here, but there's a good chance, because if you can actually do this, you're gonna stay there. But if you can't do this, you're gonna cheat and you're gonna go in. Or if you're here, if you can't load over this foot right here, if you go here, that means you can't, you don't wanna move there. So again, it comes back to the ankles and the feet.
All right, so a couple, couple uh, things that, that I want to finish up on, and we're right on time. So in summary, our players don't have the answers. They, they, what's that? Can you speak a little louder? It's kind of hard to hear. Sure, absolutely. Thanks for letting me know. So our players don't have the answers. And they may not think they want the answers, but I think as coaches, we owe it to them to get the education we need to feel confident that we, we can say, hey, would you like to learn how to serve? Not just toss the ball in the air, get the toss in the right place, toss it lower, but to really take them through a progression. And the only way you can learn that is if you decide as a coach, one, this is important to you, and two, uh, that you're willing to find the coaches and the mentors and the people that can help you become an expert. Because that's what happened with me. If you remember, I had a 100 mile an hour serve when I was 19. Four years later, I was playing Chang at the US Open. That wasn't supposed to happen, okay? I had two surgeries. By the time I was 25, my body was breaking down. What did I do? I went on a search to heal my body. When I was 30, I broke the top 100, changed my serve again, just like a golfer changing his golf swing, just like Djokovic changed his serve. Granted, he had a lot more success than I, do, than I did in the game. Uh, but at 32, I was hitting 136 miles an hour. And then remember, I told you, when I started coaching, I didn't feel confident teaching the surf 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I just made it my mission to learn everything I could about the serve. And you could start right now and say, you know what? There's education out there. There's a way to learn this. And here's where it syncs up to the game of tennis. Again, we already have distractions out there. We have video games, we have other sports, we have pickleball on the rise. 30 minutes you can go out and play pickleball and feel confident. You know, my girlfriend, she's never played tennis before. I tried to give her lessons. They were the biggest fights we ever got, and we were on the tennis court. But when we went out to play pickleball, we had a great time together. That's what we're, that's what we're up against. But like I said earlier, there are players out there that love this game, that want to learn how to serve. And I think we could start to figure out ways to give them that education. So one idea I have, and I'm just throwing this out there because I don't, I don't profess to have the answers, is what if your club offered a one serve workshop every month and you just signed up to learn how to serve? It wasn't a part of the, the clinic. It wasn't a part of uh, your drill group. It wasn't cardio tennis. It was actually, hey, a serve clinic once a month. Maybe it becomes once a week and you get your five players at the club that want to serve like Federer to pay you 20 bucks or 30 bucks or 100 bucks per, whatever the number, I don't know what the number is going to be, but what if there was kind of, that was like a side thing, right? Or what if there was an offering that people could do video analysis and really learn these drills that I've showed you today? I think there's possibilities that maybe we haven't considered in our, in our industry, in our sport. And I think if we want people to keep loving the game, they need to feel like they can get better. And imagine the feeling if you actually learned how to serve, if you felt like for five years you had the patty cake serve and now all of a sudden you uncovered the secret to how to serve, I would imagine that would feel pretty good. I know it feels good to me when I find answers to things I've been looking for. So in summary, I just want to say that um, you know, we have an opportunity here to rewrite the story of, of this story around the serve. It's hard. We can't do it. Everyone's in a forehand grip. People don't want to learn the serve. We'll just do it at the end of the lesson. I think there's an opportunity to change the story. And that's what I encourage all of you as coaches. Don't be good coaches. Be great coaches. Figure out how to lead in this way and inspire your, your players to be better. Thank you very much. So uh, I, left, I left time for questions. 13 minutes for questions if you have them. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Going all the way back to the platform. Yep. You uh, you mentioned hey turning your back foot out just a little bit, possibly you know, spreading out that back foot, and you should really reserve that. I took it as reserve that for your higher level players. Um, is there a magic to reserving it for higher level players, or is there a point where you just say hey? You're, you're newer, but let's just start here anyway. Like, is there danger in that? Can you just flesh that out for me? Uh, dang, uh, compared to doing what instead? Well, the way I took what you said yeah. was, hey, reserve this for your higher level players. 
And I guess I'm asking, is there a reason or is there a problem if I start younger players in with the foot out, with the back foot out? Oh, I got you now. I got you. Okay. So the question is uh, around the stance, around the platform stance. And uh, I talked earlier about how when you get in the stance, um, turning this back foot out to get more turn for a player that's not advanced. Um, it's a test. It's a test to put each player in a position. Everyone's going to feel comfortable in a different stance. So there is wiggle room here. And then once they get comfortable, you can have them here or you can test it where they turn it out and you can start to observe to see what happens. Here's one thing I'm noticing though. When people send in videos to me, a lot of times they will send videos serving from the deuce court, right-handed. And they've turned the foot out because they saw my lesson or they got coaching. And what I find is if someone's really excessively turned like this and they're in the deuce court, they can't hit the wide serve very well. So I actually, we didn't cover this, we should have, but that's why it's, I love the banter because it reminds me, oh, I missed this part. In the deuce court, I typically like to have the front foot a little bit pointed and this foot parallel. So it's almost like that, only like that. What we, what we see sometimes is people are splayed out. We don't want this because the energy is going in different directions. So in the deuce court, I like this. Then when we move to the add court, I like a little more of that turn because it facilitates that top spin or that kick serve. So everyone's gonna be different and you have to test it out. So yes, you could try it with the lower players, but I find when, they get, when they're in this position, it's a little too extreme. If they're here, they can just learn more of the basic surf. But I'm not gonna give you a, a black and white. That's for you to test. You said the June seventh bracket fit online. Yep. Yeah. Are they going to start doing in person training again? That's up to Greg. Um, you know, he's working on golf and baseball as well. But right now, it's still in person, and it's a one day. It used to be two days before the C the yeah. C word took effect. But um, yeah, it's it's racketfit.com, a one day event. I teach half of it. Greg teaches the other half. I do the technique portion. You'll see a lot of things that I taught today, but some things that are different. And then, of course, you'll learn the screen, which can screen whether the person has issues with their hips, their knees, uh, their forearm, uh, their ankle. Uh, it's, it's a great program because it, it helps you see things in a different way. And I hope that you guys you know, see things in a different way after today's presentation. You were demonstrating back here the arm down. Yep. I've seen some big servers that have the width from here. Yeah, so uh, great question. I think there's wiggle room. You know, with my serve, not saying my serve is, is the best or the most uh, biomechanically efficient. When I, when I get to here, my hand's about at the waist. You know, fetters a little bit lower. Listen, if, if you're more like Roddick and you bring the racket up and then you drop it down and you can do it, I'm good with that. What I find, though, is that if... If players start to get in here early, like if they're here before the ball is released, which is what I see a lot, that creates things that happen after. So I, I like to have the racket about at weight, waist level or below so that these other things don't start to show up. But again, I'm not here to say, oh, we see pros doing this. If they're doing it and if there's a lot of things that are correct, they're going to keep doing it. And we also know there's a lot of pros that have inefficient serves and they're still making a bunch of money and doing really well. So it's not about saying one size fits all. What I'm about is saying, here's a framework that I think makes teaching the serve easier. Now you go play with it and you can have some gray area and you can step outside the lines, but you have some parameters now instead of saying, oh, I don't even know. I don't know which direction to go. I've got some guidelines to follow. Can you talk just for a minute, like the, the, the benefits or the risks uh, of drawing them in the back foot? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I didn't talk enough about the platform because here's my theory on the platform and the pinpoint. So the platform is where you toss the ball and you do not move the back foot before you make contact. The pinpoint is when you move this foot before contact. I'm all about the pinpoint if, if you can coil and turn. But what I find is that when this, as soon as this foot comes up, 
we lose the ability to coil because it's actually harder to coil. I actually feel a stretch here when I do this. It's easier if we keep the foot here to coil. The second part of the equation here is there's a reason why people gravitate towards this instead of keeping the foot here. Do we know why that might be based on what I talked about? Why would people want to come here instead of going here? Forward momentum. Forward momentum, okay. What'd you say? Easier to keep the ball in. Easier to keep the with the poor technique, right? I'm saying. Yeah, the biggest thing is that players don't know how to load the back leg. So if you can't load the back leg, you're going to want to move the back leg. You've got to go somewhere, and you need some momentum, because if you can't do this, which is where the, the power is, is here. If you can't do this, then you're going to find power somewhere else. So my belief is that let's teach our players how to load the back leg, and then if you want to go to pinpoint, you could still be loading when you bring it up. What I'm concerned about is that when people move this foot, a lot of times they move it to the side, yeah. so now they're facing, so we, learn, we lose the ability to coil. And I don't know about you, Goran Ivinicevic could do this, but our players at the club can't. So I'm trying to make it easier to learn how to do this. But again, if someone can't do it and they got a tournament next week, you're not going to change their stance. I don't change players' stances knowing that they are going to be competing. I look at it as like, here, these are the long-term, this is a long-term play, long-term drills, and uh, let's get them stable in their stance first, and let's get them to use their body more efficiently. Any other questions? Yeah. And rotate, but keep their back foot down on the ground. Yep. You know, because it just seems to help them self-control the toss and get balanced. We're talking about beginners. Sure. And then our next progression is to learn to do what you're talking about yep. on a hop. Yep. And all that. So if you don't mind just commenting yeah. on that. First of all, I appreciate your willingness to accept that you may be wrong, but I don't think you're wrong. But I thank you for checking the ego. I'm wrong about a lot of other stuff. So am I, by the way. <laughs> just ask my girlfriend. So. Uh, Here's where I would go with that. I think you're close. If you remember what I talked about with the contact, where when you're in contact, your eyes are up, I would work on, because we know there's an over-rotation component, what I would do is I'd have him do that. Did you do, do, you do it with the ball? Yes. Yeah. So here's, here's where we go with it. I just wouldn't have them come all the way through. Right? So I'm watch. Here. How does that look to you? Really good. And is it cool? Uh, the, the, the thought I had when you were talking yeah. was, you know how you want a staggered stance? Yep. It seems to me it's really awkward to get hit somebody to keep their back foot down and be in a staggered. You need to come teach the presentation with me because your questions are awesome. Thank you. Will you do that? Uh, well, Will you just, just travel? Stop. No, you're way better at this no, than me. No, but we'll but... travel around and you can ask these questions. <laughs> yeah. because, well, here's my thought. No, you're what, correct. What, what, I've, what I've done with yeah. that is I said, well, fine, we're just doing a drill. Yeah. Bring your foot over. Yes. And then you can get it to go. This is why I just need an interactive because then I can answer these questions that I forget in the darn presentations. It's 100% correct. And this is what I get concerned about is people are now going to go to the club and now do this really staggered stance. You don't want to do that in this drill. Right. When you're not using your legs, you want to do it exactly the way you're teaching them. You don't want your feet foot back here. That's why when I said in the beginning, I didn't really show it, like probably toe in the middle of the foot. Then when you jump, you can actually slide it back. But it is awkward. If you keep your legs on the ground, you don't want to do that. So you're going to be here. And again, notice I even lost balance there. They can check the balance. But notice my head. It just doesn't come through. That's the drill. Okay, because so again, what I'm hearing is just add the, the, the keep that head up. Don't let them move. Every time they move, they owe you a million dollars in Monopoly money. Ooh. I don't know what it is, but whenever I like challenge them with fake money, they do it. When I just tell them to do it, they don't do it. Like these kids these days, they're so motivated by money, even if it's not real. Um, so that's a great point, that you don't want the stance to be very staggered when you're on the ground, and that's a great drill. Two minutes, Jeff. Two minutes. There's any, anything else? I have a question for everybody, too. Yeah. 
Was that part seven in the finish, or was that the grip at the very beginning? That was the very end. The very end, the finish. So if you have a continental grip here, or even a grip that's a little more towards the backhand, so I call it a strong continental, when you start your motion, you should see the strings would face up a la Djokovic instead of like this. And it's up, and then when you go to swing and you make contact, there's still, watch the rotation, there's still a pronation element here. But when you're done, I don't know why this works, because the ball's already gone, you curl your hand at the end and you take it to the belly button, or you even take it to this pocket. But it's this up and over effect that takes you to right here. Any kind of space you'll get to Slice or kick. And then do you have a preference backhand on the middle with the strings on it? Yeah, I, I like, I like um, more towards the backhand because most people are towards the forehand and most people are flat with their serve. So we need to teach ball control first before power. Real quick, I know we have like 20 seconds left. You wrote down a number at the beginning how confident you are teaching the serve. Look at your number, and then tell me where your number is at now. That's embarrassing. Okay. What was your number at the beginning? Uh, I thought it was an eight. Eight? Yeah. And so you realize now you're not at an no. eight? Where, do you, where would you grade yourself now? Now, about a six. Okay, but, bef but now looking back on it, before, were you a six or were you lower than that? And now you're a six. Or now are you a ten? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, oh, now? Now? With, with this information? What you just saw. I'm probably more close to a seven now. Okay. Once I remember it, learn and go over my notes and my phone. So I only got you up one point with confidence? <laughs> Man, I didn't do my job. Because I don't know it yet. I don't know it yet. I understand. But once I but know it... Understanding, then... though. Yes. Understanding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Numbers? I, I was out here in the beginning with that thing. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, but uh, I, if I wouldn't rate myself on teaching to serve different levels and stuff, I know I'm confident with certain things, but I know when it comes to the serve, probably a five. Like listening and taking notes and everything, I think I increase a couple bit. A couple? Well, well you deserve a grip MD. Do you work with kids or adults? Do you work with kids or adults? Both. Okay, here's, an, ad here's an adult grip MD. Yes. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Give them a hand.